in New York is down 33% from last year, which is pretty dramatic. Whatever you at home may think about the exit polls, and the history has been that a lot of people think they impede the voting process, we all, I think, collectively believe that they do give us something about the state of the voter's mind. And as people have left the polls in various states today, we have been asking them all the maybe predictable questions about the candidates and their own trends. ABC's Lynn Schur has been analyzing them for us. Lynn, what are you finding in New York State tonight? Well, Peter, Bill Clinton may have won New York comfortably, as you said today, but he can't be thrilled with the attitude of many New York Democrats. Some pulled the lever for Paul Songus. Some wrote in Mario Cuomo. Most said they were just fed up with the options. The choice is not the greatest. There's a certain amount of befuddlement involved. I would like to see someone else. I feel as though we've been shorted. We don't have, we don't have people who can lead this country anymore. Even the man who won felt the wrath of the voters. Does Bill Clinton have the honesty and integrity to be president? About half said no. Well, I didn't vote for Clinton because of his policy about um, just all the, the back stuff as far as his, um, his extramarital affairs, his uh, um, golfing in an all-white uh, country club. Still, enough of his voters put the problem in historical perspective. Uh, I don't know. Did, did uh, Jack Kennedy have the integrity to be president? I, I think, you know, we're all human, and uh, I don't think he did anything that, that most of us wouldn't have done. His personal life don't have nothing to do with his job. That's two different things. But Clinton's character problem isn't nearly as bad as Jerry Brown's so-called flake factor. Is he level-headed and practical enough to be president? Roughly three-fifths said no. Jerry Brown, I like some of his ideas, but he's generally too radical and too uh, uh, idealist. I don't think he works well with Congress or with other people, and I think that's a big uh, factor against him. But what really hurt former Governor Brown in New York tonight may have been his attempt to win black support by saying he'd like Jesse Jackson to be his running mate. While Brown got some of the black vote, it wasn't enough. More important, Brown lost the very substantial Jewish vote to Clinton perhaps a result of Reverend Jackson's reference to New York as Town in 1988. As for Paul Songus, why did he get any votes? Many actually supported him, but about half said it was because they disliked the other candidates. I liked him best. I don't think he'll win, but it's a way of saying that I'm not very happy with the other guys, like everyone else, I think. Not much of a send-off for any candidate. But Bill Clinton can take heart from the fact that one of the main reasons people voted for him... Well, that's an interesting-looking political ad. That's one we haven't seen before. Never it has seen depth it. to it, do you think? Well, I couldn't quite figure out what the message was. <laughs> it certainly, certainly was deeper than some of the was, political ads we've seen before. <laughs> Cast your mind back, if you would, for just a second, as to whether or not you've ever seen... How many elections have you... I won't ask you how many I elections don't know. you've I, covered. I, I, I have you ever coming. seen voters angrier? Never. And I've never seen them put it in effect, put their anger in effect to a greater degree. You know, about a fourth or maybe more, we don't really know, members of Congress are going to leave, leave Congress. And that's something they don't do. They generally will not leave until they're carried out in a box. This time, uh, th the best guess is about 100. And uh, the um, Democrats have, have accused their candidates of almost everything you can think of. They're bruised and battered, and I'm sure they're looking forward to a vacation. And they, uh, nevertheless, think this year they think they could win. I heard one of Governor Clinton's aides say tonight, by the way, that he is not going to take a vacation. He's going to go on to Pennsylvania, uh, which is the next important test for the Democrats. And as we go through this hour this evening, one of the things important, at least we think, to ask is whether or not voters are angry at the candidates. Are they angry at the state of the economy in the world? Are they just simply upset because the Cold War is over and everybody's restless? A lot to talk about in this hour. Hope you'll stay with us. We'll be right back. ABC News coverage of the 92 vote, the April 7th primaries. Brought to you by Sprint. Why should you change phone companies when you're perfectly happy with the one you've got? Sprint's spokesperson. Volume discounts. So if you call a lot, it would be nuts to use anyone else. You have relatives in over 180 countries. Sprint lets you call them all direct. Phone cards, even in Braille. Sprint and go down and leave a cabillion people stranded. Call now and you'll even get a hundred minutes free. How many more reasons do you need?
A car is a car. It won't make you handsome or prettier or younger, and if it improves your standing with the neighbors, then you live among snobs. A car is steel, electronics, rubber, plastic, and glass. A machine. And in the end, may the best machine win. Subaru. What to drive. Love her, hold her, and remember our simple formula. At Dean Witter, we measure success one investor at a time. City of Joy is a sweeping achievement. Patrick Swayze is superb. If you want to change things, you have to risk. A trial, the best picture of the year. City of Joy, rated PG-13. Starts Friday, April 17th at a theater near you. With this ripe tomato, I'm going to show you how this new toothbrush can help take care of your gums while it takes care of your teeth. Introducing the revolutionary new Aquafresh Flex Brush. Only Flex Brush has a pressure-sensitive neck that bends and flexes as you brush. So no matter how you brush, you can see the new Flex Brush is gentle on your gums. And everybody knows healthy teeth need healthy gums. New Aquafresh Flex Brush for gentle dental care. The 92 Vote. ABC News coverage of the critical April 7th primaries continues. Once again, David Brinkley and Peter Jennings. And just before we go on discussing the uh, search for future leadership in America, or current leadership, if you happen to be a Republican supporter of George Bush at the moment, uh, some thought about other political leadership. Another big story tonight, Yasser Arafat, the chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, was flying from Sudan to Libya tonight, and his aircraft is missing Someone over, somewhere over the Libyan desert. has been missing for some time. Uh, there has been no contact with the plane whatsoever. We'll keep you up to date with that story uh, as we go along. The big preoccupation, or the preoccupation, of course, is here in New York. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown, who is at about 26%, of the raw vote now in New York was talking to his supporters just a short while ago. Here's a bit of what he had to say to them and then we'll talk to him. There was a battle in the early part of our nation's history, John Paul Jones, and right in the heat of it, some people were saying, what, what do we do now? And he responded with the most famous lines in our military history. I have just begun to fight. We have just begun to fight. On Friday, we're going out to Peoria, Illinois, and stand with the striking workers at Caterpillar. And we're going to stand with trade unionists, with environmentalists, with citizens, with African Americans, with Jewish Americans, with Latinos, with whites, with all of God's children that are seeking justice and freedom and opportunity in our country. We are a movement, we're a cause to restore vitality. Vital Governor Jerry Brown now joins us live uh, here from his uh, campaign headquarters in New York City. Good evening, Governor Brown. Happy birthday. Well, thank you, Peter. You're 54 years old today. Yeah, I used to be able to avoid uh, notice of these things. So. You said yesterday you were going to win in New York. You haven't. Uh, do you think you've done well or badly at 26% of the raw vote so far? Well, I don't know where it is. It looks like it's somewhere between that and 30. Uh, it's kind of close to what we did in Connecticut. It's amazing from the perspective of three weeks ago. Uh, it's not a win. I'll have to concede that, obviously, to Mr. Clinton. But it is a powerful force within our party. We're bucking the hierarchy. Uh, we've taken on uh, almost the entire leadership group, and we're moving with tremendous enthusiasm, not a majority, but enough to be a very powerful force to advance the goal, which is a total reform and restoration of our democratic process. Governor Brown, you know as well as anybody the name of the game is delegates. Yeah. Uh, how do you get enough delegates now to win the Democratic nomination? Well, it's not as easy as it was uh, yesterday, <laughs> but I'll tell you, we're off to Virginia tomorrow in Pennsylvania. I say again, Pennsylvania is a state we can win. Uh, at this point, it's one we have to win. Uh, but the most important thing of all, I am completely committed to staying in this as long as it takes to work real change. And that's not just next month, 
It's not just this year, it's a continuous process to open up a very stagnant system that's not working for the American people. I, I was a bit presumptuous with you the last time we talked during the Illinois primary, primary for which I apologize, but let me, if I may, still stay with that same subject, okay. which is delegates. In a sense, not winning New York, do you give up trying to get the nomination and now concentrate on trying to make this party go the direction you want it to go? No, I certainly uh, commit myself to the latter, but I don't give up at all on the nomination because there's, this is such an unreal process. One never knows quite what the next morning is going to bring. And I will be standing and staying in it and fighting for uh, right up uh, to the convention. We don't yes. know what's going to happen to Clinton or Sanders or myself. Uh, Clinton is definitely ahead, but there's a lot of disquiet. 70% uh, of the people uh, like my message. Uh, it's, there's a lot of negative you take in all this. But I'll just have to tell you, we're fighting for the nomination, we're fighting for the principle that the system is broke, it's stuck, and it's going to take a movement to change it. And that's why we're here, and why, Peter, I've got to say once again, please, call 800-426-1112. Thank you. You've pledged us over $6 million. That's why we're here, and that's David, why we'll stay David in the Franklin end. David, would like to talk to well, you as well, sir. All right. The system you're talking about, Governor, was invented by George McGovern 20 years ago. You think it needs to be changed? Yeah, I do. How? Well, I think it's not just the democratic National process. Primary. I think you need an election holiday. I think you need same-day voting. I think you need full exposure of candidates. And somehow, most of all, which is our problem and not yours, the Democratic Party has to become a party of principle. It has to reach out to the millions of people that a party that should be representing the unrepresented should do. It can't well, just rely on the big money and the thousand-dollar donors. Well, That's our internal problem, and it's a very profound one. Well, since it is your birthday, I've looked up your horoscope in the newspaper you have yes I have and it says quote you are a spiritual psychic capable of perceiving who is legitimate as contrasted to pretenders and many claim you are a human lie detector able to instantaneously separate truth from <laughs> fantasy you accept all that well uh, I wish I had that kind of clairvoyance but well, I will tell you this maybe you wrote this <laughs> uh, I'll tell you this there is something that is not going to <laughs> When I see New York bombed out buildings, I see these subways that have fallen apart, it's going to take more than just some TV ads and a couple of wins. We've got to shift the power and the priorities of this nation, and if it takes me six months or six years, I'm in it for that long run. And, that, Go, and we're in it because we're supported by all the folks who are calling 800-426-1112. Thank you, Peter, for giving me the chance. Governor Brown, I, I, whether I gave you the chance, you take it anyway. We all well, know have, that. We that, have to do what we have to do. <laughs> that notwithstanding, I have a serious question Good. for you. As you look at the results tonight and you look at the exit polls, very briefly, did you make a mistake in terms of at least this primary, choosing Jesse Jackson as your vice presidential candidate? Uh, Peter, for my objectives, I did not make a mistake. Uh, I'm about truth and building alliances. I want to be the spokesman for those who are not represented. And I'm going to do that with all the energy I have. If I can win primaries, so be it. But my fundamental commitment is to galvanize the moral energy to rededicate this country to economic and social justice. That's my goal. I want to win as many primaries as I can. But when I see half the people not voting, when I see the suffering and the hardship, not just in the face of minorities, but uh, ordinary Americans... Uh, getting mm. displaced with jobs to Mexico, they worked 20 years. I know there's a lot of work to be done, Governor. and that's what I'm throwing myself into. Governor Brown, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Governor Jerry Brown, who now goes on to Virginia and Pennsylvania. A couple of other notes about his campaign, at least as show up in the exit poll. He's not doing as well with the people who vote, namely the older people. He's had a particular appeal for the young, uh, who want the system changed altogether, but he hasn't done as well with older votes. And a lot of people, 70% of the people we talked to in the exit polls agree with what he has to say about the status of politics in the country, but not a great many of them vote for him, or not as many vote for him as he needs this evening. In a moment, we'll come back to go to Clinton headquarters, talk to that campaign, and to Governor Clinton himself, who's running just a little late. Right back. Wouldn't it be great to have X-ray vision? When you've come here today, press for battle. Boy, you got a lot of pepperoni in your bread.
Get Little Caesars free pepperoni bread and two pizzas with extra pepperoni for $7.98. Pizza, pizza. And get free chocolate, chocolate. Dan figures the time he saves using Microsoft Excel for his budget is time well spent with others. Microsoft Excel, the spreadsheet for Windows. Why should you change phone companies when you're perfectly happy with the one you've got? Sprint spokesperson. Volume discounts. So if you call a lot, it would be nuts to use anyone else. You have relatives in over 180 countries. Sprint lets you call them all direct. Phone cards, even in Braille. Sprint and go down and leave a kabillion people stranded. Call now and you'll even get 100 minutes free. How many more reasons do you need? Mom sent pictures. You're as big as a house. Oh, you should see me. Moments like this were made for Gold MasterCard. With the added credit you've earned. It's a long drive. And you'll need the map. Plus, no card is more welcomed at home or abroad. Not American Express. Not even Visa. Oh, Lori, I can't believe it. How in the world? Gold MasterCard. The best gold card to master the moment. Terry is impressed with the ease of Microsoft Word for Windows. But more importantly, the office is impressed with Terry. Microsoft Word, the word processor for Windows. Wednesday. We have our orders. A secret mission leads young Indy to a brush with death in Africa. You're German. Only to have his life saved by Dr. Albert Schweitzer. And this man is doing nothing here but treating the sick. The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, Wednesday. ABC News coverage of the critical April 7th primaries will continue after this from our ABC stations. Wednesday, some take it slow. How soon until we can get married? In only six months. Six months? Some too fast. Your mother and I are getting married next Wednesday. I'm not going to the wedding. I'm moving out. For others, it's already too late. Don't tell me you're pregnant when you don't even know. An all-new Homefront, Wednesday. Sunday at a special time. Let my people go. The most spectacular film of all is a television classic. Charlton Heston is Moses, The Ten Commandments. Tonight at 10, we'll show you how criminals are cashing in with counterfeit checks as our exclusive series continues. An underground pipeline explosion in Texas leaves a child dead and 16 people injured. And tonight's Democratic primary in New York could mean the last chance for Jerry Brown. On tonight's medical breakthrough, doctors take the x-ray one better. They can now look inside your body at your beating heart. Also tonight, we'll talk with Iowa State's Pulitzer Prize winning author Jane Smiley. Please join us at 10. Harding's, our free fixings bar. I cut all these fresh fixings so you can fix your burger to taste the way you like it. If you want it to taste perfect, do it yourself at Hardy's free fixings bar. Hey, everybody's different. Are you ready for some real food? A Texas explosion more powerful than earthquake and tornado. The 92 vote. ABC News coverage of the April 7th primaries continues. Once again, David Brinkley and Peter Jennings. Just to bring up today on the Republican side, by the way, it's fairly obvious. It's President Bush everywhere. He hasn't uh, been challenged here in New York. Pat Buchanan didn't get on the ballot. Uh, though Pat Buchanan is doing 
The early returns indicate not too badly in Wisconsin, but the Republican side, the only story there tonight is President Bush. On the Democratic side, one of the questions, if not the story, is what is Paul Songas is going to do. He's doing fairly well in New York. He's done fairly well in Wisconsin uh, as well so far, but it's early in the evening in terms of the raw vote. Hard to tell exactly where he's going to end up. Uh, Songas is going to make his decision or announcement as to whether he re-enters the campaign apparently no earlier than Thursday. He early said that it was going to be Seven tomorrow. To now, David, all these people, all these people, university have said they're here for fundamental change. No one knows Washington better. What shot would they have even if they were given the mandate? Well, truly fundamental change requires a change in the Constitution, which is so difficult as to be nearly impossible. The only change I can, possible change I can see that might be called fundamental would be a limit on the terms of members of Congress. It is not a frightening and exotic change. The, Rose, uh, the president is c uh, limited to two terms, so there's nothing really unusual about it. There is a great deal of complaint about lifetime career politicians who come to Washington and stay until they die and do whatever they have to do to hold on to the seats, whether it's good public policy or not. I think there is, I don't know that it'll pass, but there is a rising public support for it. I can't give any figure because I don't have any, but that is one fundamental change that could take place. I don't see any others. But as every candidate has said, this is such a crazy year, there's no reason that we shouldn't anticipate crazy political trends, including perhaps even the very, very difficult effort to change the Constitution well, or amend it in some way. Right. Well, that is one change I think might actually take place. Okay. But not, not tomorrow morning. Governor Clinton is at this moment now entering the location in New York, the Ritz nightclub, uh, where he has come to celebrate uh, with his supporters this evening. Um, as we said earlier, we projected New York as a fairly comfortable victory for Governor Clinton, and there are people in this town, New York, not necessarily elsewhere in the state, but perhaps there as well, who may even be a little surprised to see Governor Clinton still standing after the kind of primary he and we have all had to endure. And by the way, our local station, WABC in New York, has now joined the network. We're glad to have you. We know you've been filled in pretty well by the local station. Hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the hour. Uh, ABC's Jim Wooten, who's been covering both campaigns, but has been looking very closely at Governor Clinton since the beginning, is at Clinton headquarters tonight. Jim, give us your impressions at first overall, if you will, about what you think the whole state of the primary's been like. Well, this is a very serene campaign right now. The governor has just entered this. Uh, it doesn't seem serene here because the governor is just behind me now, just entered the hall. But these people on the staff, the governor himself, are feeling very, very confident now. Their reasoning is that it is mathematically improbable, if not impossible, for either Brown or Songus to catch him now in delegates. The reasoning further goes that if Songus does get in the race, then Brown has to win 90% of the remaining delegates to even catch up with Clinton. Jimmy, what stands out most for you about this campaign in New York? Oh, in New York, it has to be the fact that Clinton has taken hit after hit after hit after hit, and he won. And how close is this result, though it is a victory, to what they thought it would be when they originally came into the state? Well, Clinton has always said he thought he would win New York. They were very frightened about a week ago, a week to 10 days ago. They settled down into a routine. I think it was a good counsel to them to go out to take on Brown every single time they could, debate after debate, two on two, one on one, every time they can do it. It worked for them. That's a fairly comfortable margin, and they're very happy with it. Okay, standing beside Jim Wooten and Clinton, uh, headquarters here this evening is ABC's Chris Bury who has been with Governor Clinton every day. Chris, what's the mood inside the campaign with the handlers today? I'm sorry, Peter. What's the mood with the handlers, Chris, the people who uh, manage the campaign? They had a good scare, as Jimmy said. They're happy to get out of Dodge alive, Peter. <laughs> Put the mic up to your mouth. They're very happy to get out of New York City. Uh, they liken Bill Clinton to a gunslinger who's taken a lot of bullet wounds. And, uh, they're very happy that he was able to, to get out. He took a lot of hits, as Jim said, um, and uh, they're very happy. They projected he'd get 11 to 13 percent, and uh, they're pleased with that. Okay, Chris Bury and Jim Wood, we're going to cut away from uh, there for a moment rather than try to hear both Jim and Chris Bury uh, over the enthusiasm of the Clinton campaign tonight. Um, it's most people, David, I think elsewhere in the country have followed this 
fairly closely because it's been such a big national story, the future of Bill Clinton and the overall Democratic campaign. But just in case you haven't had a real flavor of what it's been like here in New York, here's a brief review um, of some of the verbal fisticuffs that have gone on. Front runner Bill Clinton made the usual rounds of flesh, flesh pressing and baby kissing in Brooklyn this morning. Jerry! 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 This is the most fantastic city in the world. Well, here now, on the phone with us, uh, the governor of Arkansas, who, as you probably know, is running for the presidency of the United States. Good morning, Governor Clinton. Good morning, Don. So how are you? Do you want to go back to Arkansas? It's like you've been mugged here in New York, isn't it? Well, I'm having a good time, you know. I'm trying to mug back. We need you to talk, talk about AIDS. We're dying in the state. What are you going to do about AIDS? I have treated you and all the people who have interrupted my rallies with a hell of a lot more respect than you treated me. And it's time you saw This is a campaign of the people for the people, of the people, and I'm asking you, join it, and we will not let you down. I will hope that you will be open to real grassroots leadership. The convention is going to be in this town. Affirmative action, Haiti, South Africa has got to be addressed. We can't go with Britain. We need you to speak out. There was a bright light, a shadow in a shop window. Uh, we're standing outside, and here at Wall Street, we've got a noon rally here. Yeah, he's going to come out here in about 20 minutes. It's a nice day. That's when we came out. Actually, we came here to boo. No, we didn't. Yes, we did. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here in such large numbers. And thanks for waiting, folks. And now, uh, let's us. We the people. Brown and Clinton court votes in New York City. Brown gets heckled by a Jewish leader over his running mate preference as he pitches Jewish voters. Boy, the rest of the country is going to These seem quiet after weeks, all that. Clinton headquarters in New York tonight. Tony Here's Bill Clinton, cycle. our projected winner in New York. Ups and downs and twists and turns. But now that I've been through it all, I've got to admit, I had a ball. <laughs> Look at the people in this crowd tonight. Look at the people on this stage tonight. And you will see that together we did what we set out to do. We proved that Recorded. all kinds of people were aching to come together again. When the vote is in tonight in New York, it will show that Americans want to be together again, black and Hispanic, Jew and Gentile, man and woman. We all voted for the same things tonight. To all of you, all of you who helped, all of you from here, all of you from home, all of you from places across the country, I say this may be the best New York story since the amazing Mets in 1969. Their slogan, their slogan back then should be our motto tonight, you gotta believe. You gotta believe we can get our economy moving again. You gotta believe we can win again. You gotta believe we can be one again. You gotta believe we can be together, not divided by race, by region, by gender, by anything that keeps Americans from doing what Americans do best. Tonight, every person who voted in the Democratic primary, every person voted for change. Every vote for Jerry Brown was a vote that recognized the power of technology through his first derided and now respected 800 number, that the power of technology can give dignity to ordinary people and can give the average voter a say. Every vote recognized that we do need to make changes in the influence of forces at play in Washington, and ordinary people should have more say in special interest yet less. Every vote for Paul Songers tonight was a vote for change, a vote that respected his courage in getting into this race when George Bush was at over 70% in the approval polls, a vote that recognizes these are serious 
economic problems we face that require a serious response. And so tonight I ask you to reach out to those who did not vote for me, but voted for change. We want to be their campaign too. Governor Clinton talking to his supporters in New York City, and in a few minutes from now, we will talk to the governor in person. You heard him say it, I had a ball. Not sure we believe him, but that's what he said. We'll be back in a minute to talk to Jeff Greenfield, our political director, Hal Bruno, and the chairman of the Democratic Party, Ron Brown. Are the Democratic Party's troubles over or not? We'll be right back. Ask anyone who's driven a Ford lately, like the people from Car and Driver, who've named Taurus SHO one of their ten best. The people from Motor Trend, who named Explorer the best buy in its class. Or any one of the thousands of people who've made Escort the best-selling small car in America. Have you driven a Ford lately? It's more than just a question. It's an answer. Why should you change phone companies when you're perfectly happy with the one you've got? Sprint spokesperson. Volume discounts. So if you call a lot, it would be nuts to use anyone else. You have relatives in over 180 countries. Sprint lets you call them all direct. Phone cards, even in Braille. Sprint and go down and leave a kabillion people stranded. Call now and you'll even get 100 minutes free. How many more reasons do you need? Morning breath. As soon as I have my coffee, it's all gone. Whether you admit it or not, it's a problem. Okay, I have morning breath, but it doesn't bother anyone. Don't be so sure. Mine's not so bad. Morning breath's not as bad as you think. It's worse. So get scope. Its two powerful ingredients kill 90% of the bacteria that cause morning breath. Ah. Mm. Was my morning breath really that bad? Mm. There's no denying morning breath. So save your breath with scope. Because there's a man planning his retirement. Because there's a family hoping to send their kids to college. Because every investor is different, with dreams all their own. Dean Witter measures success one investor at a time. If I had a choice, I wouldn't get them. My second choice, a fast cure. Gynelotrimin starts working fast to help you bring recurring vaginal yeast infections under control quickly. My choice now, Gynelotrimin. Make your choice a fast cure. It's the right mix. It's the chemistry. That's what makes us a team. Charlie's knowledgeable, he's well-read, he's stimulating, but he's also friendly and fun. And Joan, she's level-headed, wise, reliable, warm, charming, loyal. And me, I'm a shy, modest, humble, unassuming, unpretentious, <laughs> just a wonderful guy. <laughs> Wednesday, the boys are on their own. Our parents were leaving us alone for the weekend. Let's have a party. A harmless little blast becomes risky business for Kevin. This is a disaster. The Wonder Years, then. You eat in the bathroom. Oh, yeah? You floss in the living room. What's it going to take to keep two guys together? Hi, neighbors. Wednesday on Doogie. Hi. The 92 Vote. ABC News coverage of the critical April 7th primaries continues. Once again, Peter Jennings. And joining us, of course, is David Brinkley. David, nowhere in the world is politics really as absolutely rough as this, at least when they do it without guns. Well, and yet a lot of people didn't vote today. I don't get it. Well, they're angry. They don't like the candidates. They don't like what's happening in the country. They don't see any prospect for change, so they stay home and say, I won't say what they say, but they stay home and don't vote. Yeah, but how can you throw the bums out if you don't vote? To well, use enough, the old people will turn, enough people can turn out. They, they only win if they get a majority of those who do turn out. So that doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. It is as... Frank Sinatra says, a song says, in New York, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And so I think Clinton has got it made. He's got the Democratic nomination made. 
you were saying a little earlier today that you thought a lot of this disenchantment had a little bit to do with the end of the Cold War, the end of the USA versus Soviet Union. It may, Peter. This may be moonshine, and uh, but it won't be the first time, probably not what the, the last. What the heck is this moonshine kind of occasion? <laughs> not, right? not the last. Yeah. But in any case, we have lived, most of us, most of our lives, being it um, in a Cold War, fearful of uh, nuclear holocaust and so on. All of that is gone. So there may be, and I say again, this may be moonshine. Uh, people now feel that we don't have an enemy anywhere else, so we, now we can afford to fight among ourselves. And we can at last demand that government be more responsive to our needs than to defending us against an enemy that no longer exists. I think it might have something to do with it. Of course, I can't prove it, but uh, it's something to think about. And of course, this is not the only place people are fighting among themselves, and we don't want to get too far to feel this evening, but just think about it. Um, as we've all been talking about it a little bit today, the government in Canada, its lowest popular rating uh, in many years. The government in Britain facing an election uh, and may be defeated this week. The government in Germany just had a tremendous setback. The ruling coalition in Italy, governments in Israel. Uh, even Boris Yeltsin is having some difficulty. And in some respects, and maybe France. this is, France. And, and in France, France too, the Socialist Party under siege. All of it a little bit crystallized for somebody today who reminded me, don't forget to show this piece of video tonight, which is John Major, uh, the British Prime Minister, campaigning in Britain and getting the proverbial egg in the ear. <laughs> uh, and a symbol there, of course. Um, as to the general antipathy that voters seem to feel for its politicians. It's not even New York. <laughs> in 19, it's not even New York. <laughs> Speaking of New York, by the way, the man we always call, and in fact it's his mandate to try to explain in New York uh, to the rest of the country, is ABC's Jeff Greenfield. Jeff, please first of all explain to everybody what the heck's the media been doing in this state? Well, the media kind of like to put on a show for the rest of the media. There's almost a kind of feeling here that you think we're bad, we'll show you how bad we are, and then simultaneously we cover the campaign, we cover the New York media beating up on the candidates, and then we explain how bad we are. By the way, I have to, speaking of New York, Bill Clinton's quote about the Mets, that was not the 69 Mets, this is important politically, you got to believe was from the 73 Mets when they won the pennant but lost the series, which in political terms is winning the nomination but losing the election. Well, there he, may he, be a portent there. He doesn't live here. You, no, you but gotta, you gotta give if you're going to take our slogans, let's get the year right. Believe well, me, people care a lot more about the Mets than, uh, than this primary, as the turnout showed. But it is that, Peter. It's a kind of feeling like... Like, we're proud of how, of how raucous we can be, and to some extent it's exaggerated. Do you think any of this has to do with the fact that Bill Clinton's a southerner? Yes. Uh, I believe that New Yorkers have a prejudice against, anti against the southern dialect. I think they hear George Wallace. I think they hear Jimmy Swaggart. I also think it could be flipped. If someone with a thick New York accent campaigned in Texas or Mississippi, the results might be unappealing. This is the first southerner to win a Democratic primary. Carter lost two and Al Gore got 10% of the vote. So in that sense, it, it is a victory, I suppose, for, uh, for a good old boy from the South to come to this ethnic stew and, and do well. Now, this may be a little inside baseball, but there are some of us in this town who listen to the atrocious Don Imus on the radio in the morning oh. and occasionally hear you on his program. That was really courageous for Clinton to go on this program where he really cut his, got his brain speed in. Does that mean he's passed the New York test? Well, it, it, to go on a show where, whose host, Mr. Imus, who holds my life Mr. in his hands, Imus. well, listen, I know who the power is in this town, <laughs> uh, really can eviscerate a pompous person. And for Clinton to perform with humor and a lot of self-deprecation actually helped him find his stride on New York. I assume this means that Mr. Imus will be picking the federal judges uh, should Clinton win. But more to the point, I think this is a lesson for Clinton nationally. When Clinton gets defensive, when he gives those kinds of lawyer-like answers, well, I sort of smoked, but it was in England and I didn't inhale. Didn't inhale. This turns people off. When he relaxes and, in effect, laughs at himself and his own political demeanor, he wins points, as most politicians do. I think if he can take that part of his New York experience and, and play it nationally, it's going to help him, as, because the exit polls show that the doubts about this fellow, even though he is the presumptive nominee, are, are pretty strong. Now, I have a serious question for you and for David before we move along. The New York Times, I think it was today, said that this in-your-face kind of campaigning, as it's described here, magnifies democracy. Do you think, you first of all, David, it does magnify democracy, or are we seeing in the exit polls tonight that it turns people off? I don't know that it magnifies it, but it certainly demonstrates it. In New York, well, in London, they threw an egg in John Major's face, and I don't think anybody got sent to jail for it. In this city, you can shout and scream and stomp and uh, insult a candidate, 
and walk away free. Nobody's going to touch you. What do you it's think, a Jeff? part of the system. I think we don't remember our political history when, uh, when we accused uh, John, Andrew Jackson, accused John Quincy Adams of, of pimping for the Tsar of Russia, and the Adams people <laughs> accused Jackson of being a bigamist and a murderer. Heck, this stuff is the, is the you know, Sunday afternoon tea compared to the way we used to do politics. Can you imagine doing radio talk shows of those days? Well, there Jeff, you go. <laughs> Jeff Greenfield, thanks very much. We'll come back to you before the hour is over. Let us not forget this is all about delegates. Tonight, Governor Clinton has picked up 189 delegates in New York State, which means he has 1,326 so far, 819 to reach that, as we always call it, the magic number of 2145 to get nominated. Joining us is our political director, Hal Bruno. Hal, take a look at the delegate count overall and tell us how he's doing and where does he pick up the rest? Well, two-thirds of the delegates have been selected now. He's got about 61, 62 percent of what he needs for the nomination. So all he has to do now is get some of those uncommitted superdelegates moving in his direction. There's about 350 of them hanging out there. And then if he wins just about a third of the remaining primary delegates by June 2nd, when the primaries end, he will be at or close to the number he needs for the nomination. Hal, since he looks like a winner, won't the superdelegates tend to migrate to him anyway? Yeah, they don't like him very much, and they're very worried about him. Uh, these are people who also have to run on the ticket with him. About half of them are congressmen. And uh, they're not really enthused about Bill Clinton at this point. What choice but I think do they, they have? have? Well, that's exactly it, David. They have to accept political reality. Like it or not, he's looking more and more like the Democratic nominee. You think it's in the bag, Hal? In the bag, just about in the bag. But with Bill Clinton, you never know because there's always something that could drop on you. And we've seen how each day there was something new coming up that threatened to hurt the Clinton campaign. But you always make a very good point, and that is that superdelegates go with the winner. They haven't gone yet. When we come back, we'll talk to Governor Clinton's principal superdelegate recruiter. And we'll talk to Cokie Roberts on Capitol Hill, who's going to tell us that some of them are still very nervous. We'll be right back. This ABC News special, the 92 vote, the April 7th primaries, brought to you by Sprint. Why should you change phone companies when you're perfectly happy with the one you've got? Sprint spokesperson. Volume discounts. So if you call a lot, it would be nuts to use anyone else. You have relatives in over 180 countries. Sprint lets you call them all direct. Phone cards, even in Braille. Sprint didn't go down and leave a kabillion people stranded. Call now and you'll even get 100 minutes free. How many more reasons do you need? These slip down one more time. I'm fed up with glasses that don't fit. You don't have to put up with glasses that don't fit anymore. Because at LensCrafters, we have so many new ways to make glasses more comfortable. LensCrafters glasses fit your snug points with features like new snug fit hinges that hug your head and won't lose their gentle hold. LensCrafters, for that cushion of comfort you've always wanted. I never knew glasses could be this comfortable. LensCrafters, better fit for greater comfort in about an hour. Trouble with heartburn? Well, you could change your lifestyle. Or better still, reach for Rolaids. It works fast to bring 100% relief to millions. So maybe you can't change your life, but you can get relief. Rolaids spells relief. Achoo! Achoo! When allergies come on this strong, Benadryl comes on stronger. You're about to see how Goodyear is changing all-season driving right before your eyes. Introducing AquaTread, only from Goodyear. AquaTread's advanced design channels water out of your way for dependable all-season traction, especially in the rain when you may need it most. AquaTread, the newest reason why we say the best tires in the world have Goodyear written all over them. Next, more on the Brown-Clinton showdown in today's New York primary. A Texas explosion flattens homes with the force of an earthquake and is felt 140 miles away. And Iowa teachers try to give state lawmakers a math lesson on money. Channel 5 News is next. It's tax time. You have to pay, so why do some Japanese corporations get away with paying next to nothing? They are either tax cheats or the world's worst businessmen. How do they do it? On Primetime Thursday. Solitary confinement, 
chains, SWAT teams. This could be John Gotti's new home, the toughest prison in America. I spend most of my time dwelling on revenge. 2020 takes you inside Friday. The 92 vote. ABC News coverage of the critical April 7th primaries continues. Once again, here's Peter Jennings. We were talking when we left you about uh, the delegate count, which is what this is all about, at least in the first instance, 2,145 needed. And we were talking about the superdelegates. Let's take a quick look at a, at a card or a board here, which will give you the general status on the superdelegates as far as Bill Clinton is concerned. Sorry, I didn't give him quite enough warning downstairs. They're going to uh, try to show us where we are. Listen, while they're trying to find it there, let me just tell you that tonight, well, there it is. There's the superdelegates. DNC stands for the Democratic National Committee. How many of them are? 395, Congress 264. A total of 772 of them. And 331 of them remain uncommitted. In our Washington Bureau this evening, the political consultant Ann Wexler, who is the superdelegate hunter for Bill Clinton. Good evening, Ms. Wexler. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good Why evening. are these superdelegates taking so long to come off the shelf? Well, they've been uh, watching the primaries with interest. You have to remember that uh, two of their own were uh, in the race until very recently. And I think that the contest itself has been uh, sufficiently uh, undecided up to this point that they wanted to sit back and wait. I also think that uh, the campaign itself, all of the campaigns, have been to a certain degree anti-Washington, which I think has kept people uh, sitting back and waiting. And Most do you think with this victory in New York now for Clinton and also in Kansas that you will now be able to get those uncommitted coming into his column? Yes, I really do. Do you think he wants them in a hurry or does it make him look a bit too much like the establishment candidate and leave him vulnerable to Jerry Brown again? No, I think that Governor Clinton will uh, contend as aggressively for the superdelegates as he has for all of the delegates in the race. And uh, I think you will see after the congressional recess when he comes to Washington to talk to the delegates as he has done uh, in contending in all the primaries uh, that uh, after they've heard his message and, uh, and they have met together that you'll see quite a bit of movement. Do you think it's in the bag? Well, I think it's hard to, to uh, see at this point how it's not in the bag. The fact is that uh, the governor uh, at this point has 1,300 delegates and only needs 800 more and that it's almost impossible for either of the other two people or, or the other potentially two people in the race uh, to uh, get enough delegates at this point to beat him. Okay, I will actually thank you very much. Joining us on Capitol Hill tonight is ABC's Cokie Roberts. Cokie, if you would be so kind, interpret for us what Ann Wexler's been saying about all those superdelegates up on Capitol Hill. Well, uh, obviously Ms. Wexler is in a position of wanting to bring them all over to Governor Clinton's campaign, but as I talked to people today and we were beginning to see how these elections were shaping up in, in Kansas, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and New York, uh, people were very surprised at how well Paul Sanga seemed to be doing in, in many of those states and saying, look, this is not over yet, and we're the people who can make it over, we superdelegates. We could give him enough votes so that he would, could get over the top, and we're not going to do that given these results. It's just not, he's not doing well enough. He's not getting a majority of the Democrats any place, and, uh, and that's what he needs to get, yes. say these people now. Are there doubts based on numbers or their doubts based on issues. doubts about him? Both. They're based on both, but they've, obviously if the voters decide that, that uh, they no longer doubt Bill Clinton, then the members of Congress are very quick to say, there go my people, I must follow them, I am their leader. Uh, so uh, there, is a, there is a sense of seeing how he's done, and there's an admiration for how he keeps coming back. Uh, one of the things that I heard over and over today was, in some ways, this is the worst of all possible worlds for the Democrats, that Bill Clinton is not doing well enough to say, okay, that's it it's over we have our nominee on the other hand he's not doing badly enough to say we've got to find another scenario do something else it's just limping along toward a nomination and that's not something anybody feels very comfortable with. Koki, you and i talked a little bit earlier today about the effect of hillary clinton in the campaign 
What are they saying on Capitol Hill about her? Should she get off the campaign and take a rest for a while? I think part of it depends uh, on uh, the sex of the person you're talking to and the age of the person you're talking to. Uh, there is a sense that she can be a big asset with younger, college-educated women, but that uh, she can provide uh, negatives with older people particularly and with a lot of men and women. Hillary Clinton uh, not only has said some things that sometimes get in the way, she has some views that are going to be interesting as we go along. Uh, the questions of whether children should sue their parents, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So uh, it's, it's going to be interesting. And also, Barbara Bush is so strong among the voters that that's going to be very tough for any other candidate's wife to beat. Kalki Roberts on Capitol Hill. Thank you, as always. Joining us from our Washington bureau tonight is the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Ron Brown. Are you absolutely satisfied now? Is it all over? Why don't those superdelegates uh, commit themselves? I don't think uh, that this is a question of superdelegates, Peter. It's a question of voters. We're going through the primary process. Uh, I don't think anybody should be declaring anything over, but anybody who has any rudimentary understanding of mathematics uh, knows that a fellow that's going to end tonight with close to 1,400 delegates uh, is in a very strong position to, to capture our party's nomination, How do you whether, feel whether the superdelegates take their time uh, in supporting him or not. Excuse my interruption. How do you feel about the turnout? Very low tonight. Well, it's been very low uh, throughout the primary process. There's no question that uh, voters are very disillusioned. Voters want change. And there's only one candidate in this field of either party who cannot be a candidate of change, uh, and that is George Bush. Uh, he sounds like he's trying to be, but in order to be, he'll have to run against himself. He's not going to be very credible running against himself. Well, on that subject, let us bring also from, uh, from the, we're Arizona, and I think, bring in Ed Rollins, a, a consultant to the Republican Party. You like the idea from a Republican point of view of now running against Bill Clinton? Absolutely. Uh, obviously, uh, this was a good day for George Bush when better than 50 percent of the, of the Democratic voters in a state like New York vote against Clinton, and clearly that's what they did today. And, and a vast majority of them don't think he's, uh, he, he has the integrity to be, be, be president. Uh, I, I think it's a positive day for us. And Ron Brown, um, how do you possibly make the president any more vulnerable than he is now perceived to be by Democrats. Well, first, it's interesting. Republicans just a few weeks ago, when uh, Pat Buchanan was challenging George Bush strongly, were saying, a win is a win is a win uh, every time George Bush won a primary. I'm sure that's what Bill Clinton uh, uh, is saying tonight. Uh, the fact is, uh, you're right, George Bush is extraordinarily vulnerable. He should be a one-term president because his presidency has been a failed presidency. He has failed to lead on the issues that the American people are most concerned about. Jobs in the economy, health care and education. He doesn't want to roll up his sleeves and get his hands dirty, dealing with the problems that uh, everyday working men and women and working families uh, are suffering with uh, just trying to make ends meet in this recession. Mr. Brown, I'd like to ask a question of Ed Rollins, whom we, who's sitting there. You were saying, I believe it was earlier today, that President Bush must say exactly in detail how he is going to change this country. You expect he will do that? This is for Ed Rollins. Yes, this I think Ed Rollins. Rollins. I, I, I think I think this president's going to lay out a, a, an agenda, and, and obviously he's going to get in front of uh, of Bill Clinton and the Democrats, and he and he's going to basically uh, hold on to the job that he has because the American public still has a trust in this man, and once he gets focused on the issues that matter to them, Bill Clinton or any Democrat's not going to beat him. Ed Rollins and Ron Brown, we're going to cut away from both of you sooner than we'd like to because uh, after a fairly uh, a generous celebration here in New York. Governor Clinton has finally showed up with us. Uh, Governor Clinton? Yes. Would you like to say good night? Good night. <laughs> Could somebody take a, someone take a picture of him so the governor can say good night? Are you going to take a rest or are you going to go back to Arkansas and have a little vacation now or are you going to go on to Pennsylvania? I'm going to Pennsylvania tomorrow, but I am going to take a few days off. My voice is very weak, as you can hear, and I've been told to take care of it. So I'm going to take a couple of days off and do some work and planning, but I'm very happy tonight very proud of the people of New York and the other three states who voted for me in Kansas and Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's a happy night for us here. Now you said you had a ball here in New York and we all sort of, we all sort of said sure. <laughs> well you know the darker the night the sweeter the victory. I mean we had a tough time here in the beginning but the last week you could feel it turning around and tonight we're apparently going to wind up uh, in the mid 40s well above where I thought we could so I'm very very happy tonight. Maureen Dowd sir in the New York Times writes today most colorful writer in the New York Times you have an inexhaustible supply of surprises any more farther down the road? I don't think so I'm gonna surprise the American people I think who doubt whether we can continue this campaign because I'm gonna keep it on the issues I'm gonna keep fighting for change I'm gonna fight all the way across the country and I think that we can win together I, I feel very good tonight I, I will say this 
Uh, Jerry Brown and Paul Songas both got votes of people who wanted to change. If I were the White House, I'd be worried too, especially if the best Mr. Rollins can say is if once President Bush gets focused on the problems of the American people, he can be reelected. I feel good about where we are. Governor Clinton, thank you very much. I'm sorry to walk and turn tonight. We weren't able to give you a little more time, particularly to Ron Brown. Uh, and to Ed Rollins, who we dragged away from a meeting in Arizona. Coming up on Nightline this evening, there's going to be a further review of politics tasnight, but they're also going to emphasize tonight on the fact that Yasser Arafat, uh, the chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization's plane, is missing somewhere uh, over the Libyan desert. He was on his way from the Sudan to a Palestinian guerrilla base somewhere in Libya. If he continues to be missing, if something has befallen him in a terminal way, this is going to uh, uh, send shock waves through the Middle East. But for now, David Brinkley, thank you again uh, for joining us on this uh, quite watershed evening in American politics. Good. Yeah, thank you. Enjoyed being here. We'll see you farther along the road. Okay. Sorry. I'm Peter Jennings in New York. Thank you all for joining us. Hope you've enjoyed the hour. We'll see you tomorrow on World News tonight. Good night. This has been an ABC News special: the April seventh primaries. If you wish to receive a transcript of tonight's broadcast, please send five dollars to Journal Graphics, 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203. This has been a special presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. America is watching ABC. Who's that standing behind your chair? It's Newton Furniture with knowledgeable people delivering anywhere in Iowa. Sales people to answer your designing needs, all at no extra cost. Newton Furniture, when we're behind your chair, your table, your sofa, your home furnishings, you know you found a real furniture store. Newton Furniture, providing Iowa families with service they've come to rely on for over 40 years. Iowa. There's only one way to discover America and its grandeur, up close in a recreational vehicle. Queens Trailer Ranch is one of Iowa's largest RV dealers. You'll find top names like Coleman, High Low, and Imperial. Hundreds of new and used RVs to select from. Queens also has thousands of parts and accessories on display. Now is the best time to join the free and easy RV lifestyle. Visit Queens for their 35th anniversary sale and open house April 3rd through the 18th. You're watching Channel 5. And now, live, the only news team bringing you news, weather, and sports in the first 10 minutes. Dennis Dota, Gail Nye, meteorologist Pam Dale, and Keith Murphy with sports. This is the Channel 5 News 10 o'clock report. As Bill Clinton put it tonight, everyone voting in the New York primary today voted for change, and the majority of Democrats voted for Clinton. Good evening. Clinton's strong showing in the New York primaries has Democratic leaders saying he's all but assured of the nomination. But as ABC's Mike Von Frem tells us, Clinton may have more than just Jerry Brown to contend with. Paul Songus is thinking of throwing his hat back into the race. The Clinton victory party here at the New York Ritz is the site of the famous old Studio 54 disco. And the candidate's supporters kept the place rocking all night. Bill Clinton made it known that he's thankful for the victories. I love... Wisconsin and Minnesota and Kansas and I really love New York. Paul Songus, who put his campaign on hold last month but whose name remained on the ballot, did surprisingly well in New York. He monitored returns from his home in Lowell, Massachusetts. What I come out of tonight with is the sense that I have a constituency that I speak for. And my obligation is to, is to have my voice be heard now and in the future. Jerry Brown's victory party was held at the Hospital Workers Union, and organized labor accounted for much of Brown's support. The former California governor did not do near as well as he had hoped, but he showed no sign of giving up his insurgent campaign. And I'm going to conduct this campaign for as long as it takes, until the moral energy is so strong, and so the commitment has no bounds or limit. Mike Von Frem, ABC News, New York. An explosion flattened an area of Texas this morning with the force of a tornado. One child was killed, at least 20 other people injured when a gas pipeline exploded.
People 140 miles away felt it. It destroyed homes, blew cars off roads, killed livestock, and stripped trees. One firefighter described the scene as total hell. One resident of the town of Brenham describes what happened when authorities told him to turn off his appliances. He didn't even make it to the refrigerator. Boom. It just blew up. Everything just... I didn't know what happened. I just kind of blacked out for a second or two. When I woke up, it was debris, I guess you could say, everywhere. I looked up. It was stuff all on top of us, and there was a door, and I moved the door out of the way, and then we crawled out of the kitchen, kitchen and outside. No word yet what caused the explosion. Hmm. Well, a look at the radar screen a little while ago showed some showers out and about, so let's go to the Weather Center. Pam, anything out there? Any more rain headed our way? There are a few spotty showers out there, Dennis, but really nothing making any kind of a statement in Iowa tonight. Just some very spotty rain. Right now, just a partly cloudy sky in the metro area. 53 degrees, 56 degrees in Ames. And for overnight, variably cloudy skies and 40 degrees. Not even going to mention the showers in the forecast because there really isn't going to be much there. And for tomorrow morning's rush hour, 43 degrees. So things are looking like it's going to be a little bit rainy, though, after that. So we'll have details on a little more wet forecast coming up later. Thanks, Pam. Chanting teachers swarmed on lawmakers at the state capitol today. Their march from Des Moines East High School was a protest to cuts in spending. Amelia Hamilton tells us teachers fear Iowa is about to shortchange its children and its future. An estimated 2,000 teachers, administrators, parents, and students marched to the state capitol to deliver a message. They want lawmakers to keep their promise to fund education. These are extremely critical times for public education. Educators say schools will lose over $120 million in funding over the next two years if proposed budget reforms are approved. That will mean larger class sizes, fewer teachers, and reduced learning opportunities. The House and Senate have already passed a bill that limits automatic increases in the state school aid formula. In tough times, we're going to have to expect this. In, in good times, or in times where revenue equals expenditures, we expect to meet our obligation to the school aid formula. Angie King of the Iowa State Education Association isn't buying that. She says school funding has been cut 10 out of the last 14 years, and more reductions are not the answer. One of the major things that needs to take place is a revenue increase. 71% of Iowans have indicated in survey after survey and poll after poll that they're willing to pay additional revenue if it goes to maintain our educational system in the state. The crowd took their crusade inside the Capitol to tell the legislators face to face they expect them to keep their promise to fund education. Supporters say if kids are our future, then the whole state is being shortchanged. Lawmakers at the state Capitol got more than an earful today, but educators say their fight for funding won't end here. They plan to go back to their districts and drum up support so that the education lobby will be a force to be reckoned with in the November elections. Amelia Hamilton, Channel 5 News. Leaders of the Iowa Federation of Labor want to make sure Governor Branstad keeps his word to hold off any decision about raising taxes. The organization took out this ad in today's Des Moines Register, urging voters to vote against any increase in sales taxes. Labor President Jim Wengert says he hopes the ad makes its message clear. The message that we'd like to send to both the governor and, and to both political parties of this state, they know how unfair a sales tax is, beyond a shadow of a doubt now. And they have some moral responsibilities, some moral responsibilities in this day and age to not tax the people that can least afford it to fund state government. The labor group is planning a press conference at the State House tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. They are looking for support to continue protesting against any tax increase. An Iowa State University professor has plenty of...